are many similarities between the male and the female. So I like to kind of start with those similarities. Name that. Name that. Very good. Cranium. What do you think? Name that membrane. Very good. I heard your pronunciation. Peritoneum. Peritoneum. Notice perineum and peritoneum are very close. They're only different by the T and the O. But if you put the wrong one, it's totally wrong. It's not just a little, it's wrong, right? Completely different. I'm going to abbreviate it. What do you think? Yeah, external anal sphincter. External anal sphincter. If I do this, does that help you? What is it? Bladder. The bladder. The bladder. What about urethra? Yep. They ain't leaving me much room. How about that? Pubic bone. If you noticed, probably not, but on the their labeled version, they called it pubic symphysis. Now the pubic symphysis is right in the middle. The pubic symphysis is fibrocartilage though. So if they wanted this to be fibrocartilage, they should not have drawn bone. All right. So that means their cut is not perfectly midline. Boy, even though it's pretty darn close to perfectly midline, so they messed up. Pubic bone. Now, there is a little sling of muscles. It's not really little. It looks little. And connective tissues right there that we see in the male and the female. Who can remind us what that is? Perineum. No, per perineum's out here. Look where that is. The diaphragm, which diaphragm? Because it's between the urinary and reproductive system, they call it urogenital. The urogenital diaphragm. Let me put it in blue. Instead, I'll highlight it in blue because we already had yellow there. Right there, and I'll go down like this. By the way, it's not one muscle, it's a set of muscles, a group of muscles. Okay, and once again, these are, I'll just say Kegels, these are the muscles that you exercise during Kegel, during Kegels. Okay. What do you think? Well, that was the vast deference. Females don't have that. But what you guys would have is it turns into a ligament. Mm -hmm. And that ligament is called the broads in a little different place.
called the round ligament, okay? And notice it goes forward. It goes from that uterus forward. We will see it in another picture, okay? So here's our first layer of markup. I really only included structures that you saw on both pictures um, that almost always had the exact same name, except for round ligament. So let's snag that. And then we'll start adding our depth to this. Now we're gonna have we're gonna have a picture a couple other pictures that help with some of the details from different angles. Females are supposed, supposed, that's a strong word. Um, the way our hormones are between males and females, female hormones naturally cause females to store more fat than males. It's genetic, it's biological. And hormone differences cause us to store it in different places many times. Females commonly have a little fat pad there. It's protective. It protects your pubic bone. And it also protects the most sensitive part of most females. That's right there. This little pad is called the mons pubis. Okay. That is called the mons pubis. What about this tube? Look, here's the bladder and the urethra. This is another tube that's bigger that's just behind it. You can do it. Vaginal canal? Yeah, we're just, yeah, we're just gonna go with vagina. Okay, yep, <laughs> that's the vagina. Okay, everybody talks about penis size. Well, not the gel, but people do. How big's the vagina? What? Did you know? Do you know? Here, let me explain to you. When a woman is going in to give birth, they take a finger and put it in there and fill up the cervix, the opening, to see how far it's dilated. How long is your finger? That's how long the vagina is. Three inches or so? I know what you're thinking. We'll get there. All right. That's the vagina. Look, it just goes from there to there. There's the pubic bone, there's the bladder, and there's the urethra. You know how long the urethra is on a female? Now, of course, there's variance, right? But on average, about an inch and a half. That's it. Look, if that tube's an inch and a half, then right to there is about three inches. Okay? By the way, when a woman gets aroused, it elongates, changes position, and swells. So it doesn't all, I'm not saying it's always just three inches. Okay? It's so things change. We point out, I'm not going to ask you how long the vagina is or how long the penis is, but I am going to ask you this. How long the female urethra is? And here's why. It's much more common for females to get bladder infections. It's very common for females to get bladder infections. Most females live a normal lifespan. They probably going to get a bladder infection at some point. Okay? Because your urethra is an inch and a half long. And it does not take bacteria that long to travel an inch and a half. Uh, I don't know if you know this. Sex is not clean. It's not supposed to be clean. You're swapping body fluids. Yeah, you can put things on there to try to not swap body fluids. It still ain't clean. It just you put two bodies together and it ain't clean. So bacteria from wherever on your body get there, they can crawl up that tube and give you an infection. Ladies, very important. If you have sex or sexual activity, you should go pee right after. 
because your urine is a sterile fluid, which is super cool, and it pushes the bacteria out mechanically. It literally pushes them out. And it makes it less likely for you to get an infection. Guys, how long's your urethra? Look, listen, they're gonna be bragging now. Notice I didn't say penis, I said your urethra. Remember, there's more urethra than there is penis. But the part of the penis that you see isn't all the penis. There's penis in your body, too. And by the way, we're doing the non-erect number, but hey, we're just the average male urethra, average male urethra is about eight inches long. How much longer is that than the female? A lot longer, <laughs> right? A lot longer, many times longer. So for guys, you know, guys can be lazy, guys can be whatever. I can go pee right after. Well, that bacteria's got a whole lot further before it causes a bladder infection. I would still say important for guys to do it too, but not as crucial as it is for women, as quickly as it is for women, because you want to flush those bacteria out. Okay. By the way, a common term for urinating is voiding. Void. So um, something to consider when you're working with patients, they don't know big words. Void doesn't sound medical. It sounds void, uh, empty. Void means empty. But if somebody tells you to, to void, you may not have a clue what they mean. So make sure when you communicate with patients, or micturate or void, go pee. Or even if you say urinate, just make sure they understand what you're saying. These folds on the outside. This is not the picture I prefer to label these because this is a dissection. We have a picture that shows from the front that shows all the labia, but I'm going to go ahead and put them here so you see. This one here that I don't know if you can tell where you're sitting, they're putting some hair there. They're trying to show you that it's skin. The puffier ones there, labia. Anybody know? They're larger, so they call them majora, okay? They are supposed to be a little puffier. They have a little adipose associated with them. They're protective, okay? Their job is to protect these vital opening areas. This labia here, notice they're putting color on it a lot different that kind of matches that a little bit. Yeah, color can change as you age, certainly if you have a kid. But those are kind of like the foreskin was different than normal skin. These are different than the other labia. They're more like a mucous membrane, like the inside of your cheek. Okay. And these are called labia minor. Uh, when you look at the publisher's labeled PowerPoints, they are going to use singular spellings. Please don't spend any brain power trying to learn singular for these. These are not singular structures. These are duplicate plural structures. Okay. Use blue. What's that blue structure right below the pubic bone? Yes. Clitoris. What do you know about it? Bigger than you think it is. It's way bigger than that. Because the penis and the clitoris come from the same tissue. If you dissected this, you would see corpora cavernosa. But you would see no urethra because it's further back, right? Remember how the penis had a side part that went over and angled and anchored it in? The clitoris does on both sides. That's a lot bigger than that. That goes off to the side and anchors it in the body. It's also called the crust, by the way. In AMP classes, they never give you pictures of that stuff.
so you're not going to see it on the test. So just that label is clitoris. Something else about the clitoris. It is almost always, that part of it, smaller than a penis. Almost always. Okay. But it has at least twice as many nerve endings. Okay. The clitoris has more than double the nerve endings of the penis but it is commonly much less than half the size and has twice the nerve endings. What does that mean? It's be nice to it. Be nice. It means be nice. It means it's sensitive and it means it can be very important for pleasure. Okay. What's this thing right here? That's the uterus. That's the uterus. And up here at the top of the vagina, this part of the uterus right here, that's where the uterus opens up and goes, and where the baby comes out and where the semen and the sperm get in. Very good. That's the cervix. That is the cervix. Okay. Up here, this. The fallopian tube. Okay. Notice how it goes up here and curves right there. Anybody know what that little thing is? That is supposed to be an ovary. Okay, they kind of hit it in this picture. Notice how the fallopian tube covers it. But it doesn't cover the whole thing, but it covers part of it. That ligament supports the fallopian tube, but more importantly, the ovary. I know in this picture it doesn't look like it, but that ligament right there. It's called the suspensory ligament. of the ovary. I put that because I want you to know it's holding the ovary because the picture doesn't make it look like it's holding the ovary. It helps to hold the ovaries in place. It's very important that your ovaries aren't just floating around, moving around in there. Let's take a picture and then see what else we need to do. that word mean? <laughs> there is a space right there between the rectum and the uterus. You see that? Space between the rectum and the uterus. And they decided to name it. like cute little kangaroo, okay? It's totally internal and it's not external. What do kangaroos carry in their pouch? Babies. Babies, right? Even after birth, right? Birth of the red kangaroo. Technically, they give birth to a fetus. We talked about oh, birth. birth. Well, I think they give birth to an undeveloped, okay. premature birth is what right. the birth of feels. Premature birth. Have you ever watched the birth of the red kangaroo? It will give you nightmares. Face to show it in the file. Of the I love it. It is cool. Like crawling. Yeah, crawling. Exactly. Crawling exactly. Crawl exactly. <laughs> no, thank you. 
didn't horrify me at all. Oh. <laughs> so I, I get it, though. Hmm. Ah, on the fallopian tube. Look here. Don't those look like fingers? They are called fimbria. They are called fimbria. Now, there is a process that happens commonly once a month where an ovary ejects an egg. Do you know what it's called when the egg leaves the ovary? It's called ovulation. And those fimbria do this. They actually move and waft, and they create a little vortex, and the egg goes up into the fallopian tube. That's super cool. Sometimes they miss. Where would the oocyte, right? Where would the oocyte go if it missed? Where is it now? It's now in the recto utero pouch. Okay. So I just wanted you to see that when you ovulate an egg or an oocyte, it doesn't always go where it's supposed to because this is not a pure sealed environment. There is a little space. The tube comes up on the ovary like that. But there is space there. And those fimbria create a vortex. Why? Because there's not just one place that the ovary releases the egg. It could be released from anywhere on that ovary. So you need something to, to waft to try to move it in. So get that picture. That's really all we need here. We are going to come back to this. That's why I do these three things alone on this picture. But we need some perspective of... The A to P view or P to A view, is what we might say. This is a super cool picture. Anytime you have a picture, you want to orient yourself to the image. Almost no one and orients themselves correctly to this. Watch what I'm going to show you. You're looking at the female from which way? Don't be fancy. From the back, thank you. From the back. You're looking at a female from the back. When we zoom up, I mean, if I asked anybody before showing that picture, you know, when we had it like this, which way you think you're looking at that female from? Almost there. It says front, right? I mean, that's how we're trained to do things. This is from the back. Why is that important? I mean, it's not supremely important. It's not the most important thing, but here's why it's important. See all these ligaments right here? That membrane? That's a broad ligament. Oh, okay. okay. I just heard them say that. In yeah. Time. And the broad ligament is in front. And so if we showed the uterus from the front, the ligament would hide it all. It would cover it. So it, I cannot imagine a question show up on the test. Are you looking at this from the front or the back? Because I didn't write that question, so it ain't there. All right, so you're not going to get it. But I still want you to have that orientation. And because of that, we've also learned there's a ligament that goes forward just like the vas deferens do. Here it is. So we are going to learn this ligament. I'll be honest with you. There's a lot of ligaments here we're not going to learn. There's multiple reasons for that. One, some of them aren't that good on the picture. Two, it got some buried in the other membranes. Three, there's a whole lot of ligaments to do. I want to give you the ligaments that make sense. Okay. Here's a ligament we saw from the other picture. doesn't even look like a ligament, but it's got the blood vessels and nerves running through there. That is your it's 
suspensory ligament. And keep in mind, it goes down through here to the ovary. It goes to the ovary. This group of membranes here, that is collectively known as the broad ligament. Now, when you look at the labeled version, if you choose to, you don't have to, you will see that it names three parts of it. I don't care that you know those technical names for those three parts, because most of you will never need to know those names for those three parts. But I do want you to know that the bulk of that membrane that's in front of the fallopian tube in the ovary there is called the broad ligament. There is a question that asks, what's the group name for this structure? It's broad ligament. Look at this. That's a little ligament that holds the ovary to the uterus. So that's called the ovarian ligament. So look, here I am telling you, we're not going to do that many ligaments. There's so many that we're going to learn four of them, even though we're not doing all of them. Okay. But those are the four that I may ask you on the test. Those are the only four ligaments that I might ask you. These ligaments are so crucial because they hold the uterus in place, they hold the ovary in place, they anchor all those structures so that, wow, this vagina is kind of a small tube. It's not as big and heavy as this up here. If those ligaments collapse, your uterus drops down into your vagina, okay? Your uterus can come out of your body, ladies, if those ligaments are too lax. Happens in cows all the time. Happens in cows all the time. Used to happen in humans all the time. Happened to my great grandma. She had a great baby. Well, she had 11 babies. And she stretched those ligaments out big time with those 11 babies. And when she was in her late 70s, whoop, there goes the uterus. Right? Prolapse. Prolapse. Oh, okay. Exactly. We call it a prolapsed uterus. Mm -hmm. Name this part of the uterus. Sure. Very good. So look, I'm just going to put a C there. Now this is this is cool. We learned that the stomach has a dome on it. Anybody ready to tell me what the dome on the stomach was called? Well, that's okay because I'm about to write it here. The dome on the uterus is called the same thing. Fundus. When an organ has a dome, it can be called a fundus. Okay. Name this organ slash gland. Yeah, ovary. I just put a big O on it. Notice how the two ovaries look different. Tell me why. Yeah, one of them's cut. They cut one open. Okay. By the way, the one that they've cut open, that is not what your ovary would look like. They always do this. They show an ovary with a little part of what you would see throughout the whole month. So that's a schematic showing you what would happen to the follicles. Remember we learned follicles? A little primordial and primary, and they get bigger, and they change. So they're showing you a whole monthly cycle there in that one picture. Just be able to tell me it's a ovary, okay? And what gets ejected from the ovary? OO site, right? And so this shows you, that's where it ovulated, and it shows you to be here. And what are those little guys called? Yeah. Fimbria. I don't care if you do A or AE, it's singular or plural, but they would pull that hopefully up in here and it would travel. By the way, it takes three to five days for that O site to get to there so it can move in here. It takes about three to five days for it to do that. 
yeah, the inside of the fallopian tube is ciliated. And it pushes, but it takes a long time. Okay. <clears throat> Name this tube. This part of the vagina right here on either side that goes up beside the cervix, past the cervix, has a name. That is the fornix. Now, the labeled version says lateral fornix, anterior fornix, posterior fornix. It's not four separate things. It is a ring around. By the way, so cool. When I was in college, they did an endoscope, showed us a movie of looking up in there and seeing that cervix at the top of the vagina. You know what the cervix at the top of the vagina looks like? Looks like a donut. Like a little Mrs. Baird's donut. It looks exactly like if they make cherry frosted Mrs. Baird's donuts, <laughs> that's exactly what it looks like. Because look, see it? It's round, it bulges out, but it's got a hole in the center where what needs to get up in there? The sperm, unless you want to block them, don't get up in there, okay? By the way, <laughs> sperm are shaped like that. They're freaky little dudes. We'll draw another one. They are not that big. Heck, a penis may not even be that big, okay? So the point is, sperm would look invisible. They would be tiny. I can't draw an invisible one. But what I can do is say, where do they go? Uh-oh. Which way do I go? Okay, let's go this way. What are they looking for? The egg. The oocyte. Some of them go this way. Inside, of course. That's where they go. So if you have sex and semen gets in you and the sperm get in you, that's where it's trying to go. They swim like crazy. They have a flagellum. Average sperm has 20 to 70 mitochondria that are producing the energy for it to swim up there. Some sperm, poor little dudes, they're not all that smart. They get stuck right here in the fornix. And they just spend their little life going around and around there. All right. Others go up and they go the wrong way. And then others get up there and there ain't no egg. Why? How many eggs are you normally going to ovulate in a month? And it's only going to be there for three to five days. That's it. And by the way, if the sperm meets the egg right here, that egg's moving. It probably ain't even going to fertilize it. And even if it did, couldn't implant because it wouldn't change enough to be able to implant. Fertilization needs to happen. Over here. So let me make sure you understand this. In what organ does the egg get fertilized? Fallopian tube. The other name for that tube, now I'm going to use the other name. That's an easier name. Fertilization happens in the fallopian tube or the uterine tube. Here's why. Egg, sperm, fusion, divide, 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 divide. It has to do that to be ready to implant here and grow. If it doesn't divide enough to be the right number of cells, the right type, it can't stick an implant. So, hey, you can have sex. Your egg could be fertilized. And if it was a little late, it can't implant. And so it's just going to pass through your body and be gone. Okay? That's not considered a spontaneous abortion. No. Okay. That would not be. Is there a name for? That would not be because it never implanted. Right. 
So it's just a fertilized egg that just you never even knew about. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever knew about. Okay. Um, see if I got any. Oh, structure wise. Doesn't this uterus look thick? What kind of tissue do you think most of that thickness of that uterus is? Muscle. What kind of muscle? Go ahead, contract your uterus. You can't do it. So what kind of muscle? Smooth muscle. So watch this. We're going to name the layers of the uterus now. Let's, since we've got everything else in red, I'm going to do blue. But I need room, so I'm going to move my placement of that. Okay. Now it gives me the room. So right here, where I just drew that little white line, you have a lining. probably heard of a condition where that lining gets uh, painful and grows in other places. That lining, oh, wait, I was going to use blue. That inner lining is called the endometrium. Probably heard of endometriosis. It's when that lining's in the abnormal location. I'll show you that in a little bit. The main thickness all the way across here. Look, I kind of made an M. I know it looks like an E. It's called a myometrium. Brain that is very thin. The perimetrium. So the layers, you know, we had layers of the heart, and now we have layers of the uterus. They're the endo, the myo, and the perimetrium. You may be asked to label those layers, okay? You may be asked to label those layers. We're not going to do these little guys in here, okay, just so you know. So there is what you need on this picture. Go ahead and get it. So the birth control pill doesn't stop sperm. So there's different kinds of birth control, right? So a condom stops sperm on the penis. Unless it rolls up and then it comes out and then, you know, I mean, things happen. A diaphragm, if you've ever heard of that, it's a cup that goes right here and blocks some from getting in. Pretty cool. But hormonal birth control, whether it's a shot or whether it's pills, or whether it's creams, whatever form of hormonal birth control, hormonal birth control, the attempt is maybe you won't, potentially you might not ovulate because they change your hormone levels to where you potentially may not ovulate, but you still can, nothing's perfect, okay? Um, Next step is if you ovulate and sperm get there, it can still get fertilized. It creates changes hormonally that cause your uterus to slough off that egg, even if it implants. So the idea is, and there's really multiple ways birth control works, but one, it changes your female cycle so that one, you may not drop an egg. Two, if you drop an egg and it gets fertilized, it's going to change your inner lining so it doesn't implant. And three, if it did fertilize and it did implant, it's going to cause you to have your period anyway, and it's going to be lost there. Okay. 
I know your doctor probably never told you that. Okay? They just tell you, oh, you're probably not going to get pregnant. We don't have a big class, and we're kind of young, so I'm not going to do this survey here. But back in the day when we had 16 weeks, you know, we didn't have as many classes. They were all full to the gills. We used to have a classroom that was 65 people. So I used to have a lot of people in each classroom. And I would always ask, how many people got pregnant on the pill? Your mind would be blown. How many people get pregnant on the pill? Okay. Um, if they say 99% effective, there's lots of ways to manipulate numbers. Or if it's 90% effective, here's one way. I'm not saying they do this, but let me just tell you. It's 99% effective. If you have sex 100 times, you only get pregnant once. Oh, that's a terrible way to look at it, right? Does it really mean that only one out of 99 get pregnant? Numbers can be manipulated, y'all. Just think about that. Uh, it is hormonal birth control is pretty effective. I'm not going to say it's not, but you can get pregnant on the pill. There was one class I had that was in a lab, not the big lecture hall, like 30 people, nine girls in there got pregnant on the pill. <laughs> I know. No, it was on the pill. This was 20 years ago. It was a pill. And it wasn't always the same pill. But yeah, they weren't on death row shots or, you know, North Plant or the new North Plant or those things. So what is the only safe birth control? If you, I mean, if we're just going to be honest, the only way not to have a baby is to not ever let sperm get in there. That's honestly, that's the only way for sure. Notice. It takes, we didn't say this yet. This is the number they used to always give. The average number of sperm in the male ejaculate is 300 million. It's not anymore. It's a lot lower. I'll just tell you that. But that's the traditional number that they use. Okay. 300 million sperm. How many eggs? One. They get in the vagina. I don't know if you know this. Is warfare. The vagina is very acidic. Do you know why? to protect you from infections. Well, sperm hate acid, it kills them. So immediately upon ejaculation, done by the acid, they just burn, okay? But the sperm aren't alone, they're in a fluid called semen, which is basic, that buffers the acid, cool. So the semen goes in there and buffers the acid. And that protects some of them, but not all of them. There's a chemical in semen called semen o -gelin. You ever remember those commercials? Are you gelling? Anyway. It clump. You, you may know this. Sometimes <laughs> semen comes out and there's a clump of it. Okay? It holds it together for about 15 minutes and then it leaves of that is to protect the sperm from the acid, to hold them together so that the other fluid can neutralize the acid. Then it's, it's a protein. It lets go of them, and then it can take off swimming. And where are they trying to go? Here? No, but they will. Here? Yep. There? Yep. That's, that's the idea. So they get over here, they find an egg, and hopefully, if you know, it's what you want. They fertilize that egg. How long does sperm live inside of you? Prepare to be horrified. They can live up to a week. So here's the deal. They say that it takes millions of sperm. And what they do is they get the egg and the collective hundreds of thousands or whatever that are attacking the egg, they kind of break it down to a point where one can work its way in 
and then magic happens and it solidifies and only one nucleus gets in. It's a concept. So, even though guys might have this many, if a guy produces, what's mil stand for? 10 million per milliliter of semen. He is sterile. You are considered sterile if you're making 10 million sperm. They say, and that's per milliliter of fluid. So if there's five mils in an average ejaculate, you could have 50 million sperm. And they're going to tell you 99.9% .9 chance you will never have a baby. Sterile doesn't mean no sperm. It means not enough sperm to fight the acid, to get past the fornix, to get the cervix, to get in the fallopian tube all the way to the end of the tube, and to break down the egg so you can fertilize it. But all that really needs to get there is one. You can not have intercourse, and you can get some semen on you, and they can find their way in you, and you can get pregnant. Don't think a penis has to be all up in you for the sperm to get you pregnant, okay? If sperm get on you there, and they get on a hand, and they find their way into you, you can get pregnant. The only way not to get pregnant is never let a sperm get there in any way. And don't be named Mary, and don't be written about in the Bible. Okay, that's the only way. That's the only way to not get pregnant. Okay. What about like people who get like vitamins So sometimes the tubes grow back together. Yeah, and it's very rare compared to how many people have vasectomies and are having sex and don't ever have that happen. But it can happen. Okay, but it's probably not going to happen. Okay, but it could happen. Um, yes. Say again. Can acid lead to more to cause To cause burns? Oh, oh, oh. I wouldn't say, yeah, it's not the acid. So if a female can't, uh, if, if she's not conceiving, it's probably not the acid most of the time but it's more likely hormones ovary or endometrium more likely okay it's more likely all right let's see so now you, you you have a bigger concept of some of these things maybe so what is that Let's make it bold, because it is bold. Here's the lining, right? Yeah, wherever. The endometrium should stop here, but sometimes it doesn't. If you have the endometrium in any abnormal location, it's endometriosis. So when the lining grows in an abnormal spot, okay? I'm telling y'all, you already know this, most of y'all are females. It's common. It's quite common. I probably never had a class where somebody didn't have it, okay? That means it could grow up to two, or look here, it could grow down your vagina. And if it grows up the tube, here's something important to understand. If it goes all the way in the tube, when it gets here, that is not a sealed environment. Now it can grow here on your ovary and on your ligament. And now it can be here. Turn the corner and get on the outside of this one. Don't know if you remember that other picture. That's the abdominal cavity up above that. So I'm going to show you another picture. It can grow in your abdominal cavity around your abdominal organs. See, endometriosis 
there's many levels. There's a kind that's mildly uncomfortable. That's just a little bit. But it can be so severe that it's debilitating. And think about what happens to the endometrium every, every month. Every month. It gets thicker to pre prepare for the implant of the fertilized egg. Okay? That's what it's doing. That's nature. So day one is your period. And then commonly, the average person, 14 days later, you ovulate. And then you get pregnant, maybe consider pregnant three or five or seven days after that when it goes in and implants. Okay? The last day is the day before your period starts. So on a female cycle, let me just write this. The normal female cycle, you ever heard it called a monthly cycle? Because I'm 28 days. Yes, I know. Most of you probably aren't 28 days unless you're taking some kind of hormone therapy called birth control that helps you be on 28 days. Day one is when you have your period. Day 14. Ovulate day 28, the day before your next period. <laughs> That's, I mean, if everything's that way. Most people aren't that way. Most periods aren't perfectly regular by the day. Some are, though. Some people without any hormones or anything, man, they have a cycle that's so regular. They know, uh, have, I only bleed for three days, and then it's done, or two and a half days, and then... Hey, you can have a period where you bleed for a week. Maybe some people one day, some people five days. Maybe you have a heavy period and maybe you have a light period. Things are different. But what I want to help you see is the traditional model, normal. Normal ain't always normal. Normal ain't common, necessarily. Is you ovulate in the middle. When can you get pregnant? Only when there is an egg and a sperm. So here's the cool thing. If you have a regular cycle and you watch your cycle, keep track of it. When's it start? When's it end? And if you notice there, here's something else. When you ovulate, your temperature goes up about a degree that day because ovulation is inflammation. This swells up and it spits out an egg and that's inflammatory. So it's very common for females to not have ever been told this, but about two weeks after your period, on one side or the other, you'll have some little discomfort or cramping or something. And probably, you're thinking, you're probably thinking it's your bowels, to be honest with you. Because it's just a day, it's just a little bit, and it's gone. You're like, oh, okay. That's called metal schmerz pain. It won't be on the test. But it's the eruption of the ovary ejecting the oocyte. And so if you can put these things together, you can go, oh, here's my period, about 28 days, and you start to pay attention for that, and you chart your temperature, you can figure out about when you ovulate every month, and then you know exactly when you could get pregnant, or if you so choose, not get pregnant. And just for that week, make sure to have no sex, okay? Or be very protected or what have you. Back to the endometriosis and why I went there. Take this picture and then we'll change to the other. Man, we're not even going to get to talk about ninja sperm today. We're going to run out of time. Y'all don't even know if I'm joking. You're like, is he serious? I am serious. Okay, let's put all that that we just learned together. I'm going to make the egg real big, though. What if the egg went here? And what if you have endometriosis? What I didn't tell you yet is that... The sperm don't stop 
at the fimbria. No, he ain't that big, but there he goes on his little hunt. And he found an egg. No! no! <laughs> if you have endometriosis, it can fertilize, it can grow, and it can implant there. Or in your fallopian tube. Is in the fallopian tube considered ectopic? Is it yep. just anything up our uterus? Very good. So any time you're pregnant and it's not in the lumen of the uterus, it is in It is an ectopic pregnancy. That's a pregnancy in an abnormal location, meaning not in the uterus. This is ectopic. Tubal is the most common ectopic. But this can happen. This is so common. I learned about it in 1991. I was in a radiology class, and our radiology professor said, you know what? Sometimes we take x-rays. And we find babies behind the uterus. I found mummified fetuses, cat fetuses. When we go in to do a space, so you'll palpate. You'll be like, what? Is this like a bladder stone or something? You cut them open and they have these like mummified fetuses like, floating around in their yeah, abdomen. They calcify. Yeah, they're hard. They're like, the, the they're body, so hard. The body calcifies them. So they've started calling them stone babies. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. And so, crazy thing. He said, sometimes we see them on x-ray, sometimes they find them on an autopsy. You know, people miss periods. Sometimes you wonder, sometimes you don't wonder. Sometimes you may have had that happen. And so it may have been planted and it just may not have developed much. Crazy things can happen in the body though. Uh, you could Google this if you choose. There's one called the 46-year pregnancy. Um, there's others where women have had endometriosis and they got pregnant and they were not really getting health care, so not checked out, but knew they were pregnant, right? Time for the baby. And it just ain't happening. The baby ain't coming out. So there was this one case of this lady that went to the hospital to have her baby. Also, she was 75 years old, side note. So that's this one. There's a different, oh, there's there's many. Yeah, there's many cases. Yeah, that one, the 46-year one. Yeah. yeah, there was one called the 64-year one. Oh, well, that was crazy, too. So can't get out. And the doctors told this lady, that baby is in your abdomen. It's here. It grew here to full term, pushed all the organs, grew in the guts, right in its own sack and they said this was back a long time ago this is over 50 years ago and they told her if we cut you to get that baby you're dead we cannot save you and she went home she just went home she didn't want to die she went home and this is the crazy part that full-term baby yes the baby died her body calcified it completely. And uh, she carried that baby for the rest of her life, which was 46 more years. That's why they call that one show the 46-year pregnancy or something like that. When she died, they did an autopsy on her and totally documented it, and the baby was completely calcified. So just when you're working in healthcare, Biology, the body, is a crazy thing. Because I'm just wondering, how, how, how could the baby um, get the necessary um, nutrients and all that? Because the endometriosis is just like the inside of the uterus. It's a blood supply, and when it implanted, it grew a placenta. And it grew a womb. And it had enough. It's very rare for it to grow that far. Most of the time, it won't, it won't do that, and it'll calcify and stay small, okay? Many times, the body will just destroy it, and there will be no remnant of it. But sometimes, rare cases, 
it's got enough blood supply that it can survive to full term. Okay. Now, if it happened, it's it's there's potential they could save the woman and the baby, right? Back then, no way. Um, probably now, if it happened though, they would tell you, hey, for your safety, if you're getting health care, for your safety, you need to terminate this because most likely it will kill you. That's the thing about a pregnancy that's in the tube. If you let it grow, it's going to rupture your tube. You might bleed to death and die. Okay. If it's back here, it could rupture things. You could die. May not make it to term with the baby because you may not make it. <clears throat> All right. Get that picture of the stone baby. You're going to remember that for a long time. That means so much. I've never heard that. But they are literally mm -hmm. like. Little mummies, yeah. right? Little calcified mummies. Last picture. We'll do it fast. Now that's what it looks like when it's not dissected, right? That area of the female. Who can help me by telling me what is this called between the anus and the labia? Very good. Perineum. By the way, in hospital care, this whole dotted area is, they might say, oh, you're on perennial care. It means that whole area, but technically perineum means this here, okay? Hey, if you're having a baby at a hospital, they might just cut you back here so that you don't tear. So they're, they're cutting you basically at the perineum. Do you know what that procedure is called? Episiotomy. Okay, that's an episiotomy when that would be cut in the hospital birth. Okay, there's pluses and minuses to that. There's pluses and minuses to circumcision. I talked about other stuff with you guys, so I didn't go into that much. Okay, here very easily labia. Which ones? Yes. Those are the ones that typically you will grow hair on because they are normal skin. Okay. Here, the inner one called the typically you will not grow hair on those because they're different tissue than normal skin. They're more like the inside of your cheek. What's this the opening for? So that one's the opening for the vagina. And look here. That one's the opening for the urethra. Two separate openings. See, females are cleaner than guys. Guys have one opening for both. Girls have separate openings. Here's something very interesting that you may not have thought of. These inner folds, the labia minora. Look, there's one on this side. There's one on this side. Yeah, they're different on every person. Some people, they're bigger. Some people, they're smaller. Some people, they're darker. Some people, they're lighter. But the point is that these are kind of damp a little bit. And so you get two damp tissues that are like this and put them together, and they usually stay together. And then you're standing up like me right now, and you got these other labia that are puffy. It keeps everything closed to help prevent infections. This is biology's way of keeping that part of your body closed up most of the time, make it puffy, put a separate little inner one that likes to stick together, and then you protect yourself. Okay? One thing about, remember, vagina pH is an acid, right? Here's the thing. When girls are really young, before you hit puberty, you're not acidic yet. You're basic, okay? And acid fights infections. So if girls are having early, they can get infections, okay? Because your body, as you age and mature, it becomes acidic to protect you, all right? Um, this view right here, there's the clitoris. All you're seeing is the tip. It goes back here, and yes, on both sides, the 
crust and the other stuff go back. But back to these labia. Notice they come together at the top. Now, depending upon who you are, you may not even know that part's connected to this because these may be bigger and it may not look like they're connected. But if you trace them up, they're going to be connected and they're going to go over the top of it and it forms a little, look at that, a little foreskin to protect the clitoris, just like for the tip of the penis. Okay. By the way, what's here? What's this area called? Lots of pubis. There's two other things I need to do on this picture. Hey, if you've got to go, I understand. I'm going over, so you can just go. Okay, we're almost done. Get the picture. There's two other things, but I, I got to clear it because there's just too much on the board there. I know you've heard of a hymen. Do you know what it is? It is tissue. Good answer. We could consider it a membrane. It's a tissue-based membrane. Okay. Commonly, notice I was very careful in my language. guards the opening to the vagina, okay? By the way, it's supposed to have little holes in it because even little baby girls have mucus and it needs to drain. It's actually a problem if it's completely sealed up and that could lead to infections. And if you took your baby to a doctor, they would put little micro tears in it, little tears in it to help it to drain, okay? Um, if it's completely sealed up, it would be called an imperforate hymen because it had no perforations. Okay, next thing. Labia minora, can you see that there's a space between my two hands right there? So that's not up in your body, right? That's outside your body, but it's actually a potential space right across here. Tell me what the little entryway past the nostrils in here, what's that first part in the nose called? Vestibule. I have a tongue yet, what I call? Vestibule. Hey, what's this called? So if you, if I point here and ask you about the Space. What is the name of that space? It is the vestibule. You need to know some girls are born without a hymen. Never would have had it. Some girls fell on a monkey bar and ruptured their hymen when they were in elementary school. Okay, bikes. horses, dirt bikes. bikes, kicked in soccer, gymnastics. So, if somebody believes they're not, you, you don't know. All right, that's it.